This episode of Business Breakdowns is sponsored by Canalyst. Canalyst is the leading destination for public company data and analysis. Founded by a former buy side analyst who encountered friction in sourcing, building, and updating models, Canalyst is now used by over 300 institutions, including the largest money managers in North America and by a number of guests on the show. If you enjoy our exploration of what makes a company tick on business breakdowns, Canalyst should be the foundation for your quantitative analysis. With high quality fundamental data and models on a growing database of global equities, Canalyst helps you ramp up on a new name quickly, understand the key drivers that matter for a public company, and streamline the model update process during earnings. If you're a professional investor, you should give them a shout. For more information and access to the Canalyst model on the business we break down in this episode, go to canalyst.com slash breakdowns. That's C-A-N-A-L-Y-S-T dot com slash breakdowns. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts and podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Today, we will be diving into Facebook, a business that requires little introduction. Facebook was launched in 2004 from Mark Zuckerberg's Harvard dorm room. Zuckerberg has since grown Facebook into the largest social network in the world and continues to operate the business today. To break down Facebook, I'm first joined by Robert Cantwell, founder and CIO of Upholdings. Rob's unique background makes him an ideal person to speak on Facebook. Rob shared a dorm with Mark Zuckerberg, went on to work at Elevation Partners, a large private investor in Facebook, and eventually became CFO of Everlane, where expansion was closely tied to the growth of Instagram and its advertising tools. We touch on how Facebook successfully navigated the transition from desktop to mobile, what drives the value of the network, and where Facebook may drive value in the future. I am then joined by Jesse Puji, a familiar voice as a host of Business Breakdowns. Jesse's time as co-founder and CEO at Ampush make him ideal to break down the advertising business of Facebook. During our conversation, Jesse outlines the basic dynamics of the Facebook ad ecosystem, the economic proposition to an advertiser, and how to assess risk to Facebook's control of the digital ad market. Facebook is such an interesting business, and we could likely speak for hours on the potential opportunities for growth. We decided to focus on the core advertising business today, given it represents 98% of the revenue. In the future, we want to dedicate individual breakdowns to WhatsApp, Oculus, and potentially other Facebook initiatives that are worthy of their own deep dives alone. I hope you enjoy this conversation on Facebook. Rob, thank you so much for joining us today to break down Facebook. I think it's a business that's clearly pervasive in the life of Americans and the global population, but not necessarily one that people really understand. I think a good place to start would be if you could help us just quantify the size and scale and breadth of Facebook's business, and then talk about how people interact with it today. It's funny because it's a product that everybody uses, so everybody has an opinion about it. But that's just people focusing on the media side of the business, on the users, on the 3 billion people around the world, excluding China, that use some combination of their platforms. And when we're looking at this business as investors, we're much more focused on their customers. And so when we think about the scale of Facebook, we think about the 10 million businesses that actively advertise on one of their platforms. That 10 million number, that's about double what it was five years ago. The average business spends about $11,000 a year on Facebook acquiring or engaging customers. The average business grows that Facebook allocation by about 5 to 10% a year. And Facebook as a company is able to grow that advertiser pool pretty consistently at about a million new advertisers per year. So it's really simple. 10 million advertisers spending $11,000 each and Facebook will do about $110 billion in revenue this year. And breaking it down just one step further, a little more than 20% of that is happening on Instagram. They have a few billion dollars in other bets, Oculus and marketplaces and other toys. And then if you look at a geography standpoint, a little more than half of that is coming from outside the United States. 
And so if you kind of take a step back and try to box in what type of business Facebook really is, is it an advertising business? Is it a social network? Is it a media business? It kind of takes on this amorphous creation. What do you think the best way is to kind of describe what the true core business of Facebook is today? The business of Facebook is a media network. It aggregates viewers and attention and it sells that time to advertisers. So in that respect, it's a very traditional media business model. But the web offers tools that are so much more powerful that the digital online advertising landscape looks quite a bit different than the traditional media landscape of cable television of yesteryears. As we look at the digital advertising landscape, there's really three big categories that we track. You've got social networking, streaming media, and search. Social networking, this is really where Facebook plays. So Facebook has more than 80% share. There's a second tier of players. You've got LinkedIn and Twitter. They've got about 10% share, and that's shrinking a little bit. And then you have this third segment that people are currently very excited about, which is Pinterest and Snap. They have about 5% share of social network spend, and their share is growing a little bit. Now, there's this second tier that we call streaming media. Facebook is not often compared against Netflix because Netflix looks and feels more like a traditional cable subscription because that's how they choose to monetize. But Netflix is a paid media company. So Facebook is not paying users to post, to interact with businesses, with people that they know. In the streaming media bucket, we look at companies like Netflix and YouTube and TikTok as competitors to each other because they are all paying for the content that is showing up on their platforms. They're choosing to monetize a little bit differently, whether it's through subscription or through advertising or Hulu that's confused and is trying to do both at the same time. But ultimately, we view streaming media as a paid content platform that's different from social network. And then the third is simply search, which is high intent based behavior, which is primarily Google and Amazon that play in that marketplace. So for today, we're really focused on social network ad spend and Facebook's dominant position within that. And so it's kind of interesting if you think about it, amassing 3 billion people, Bill Gurley talks about aggregating demand and the importance in the context of building a business. There's all this optionality kind of inherent in Facebook's business model, but the business has evolved in a lot of ways. And frankly, it's still somewhat of a nascent business founded not all that long ago. And I think what's so interesting is your career arc in a lot of ways tracks adjacently to Facebook itself, given your experience as both an investor and an operator, it'd be great to kind of hear about the vantage point you had and how that impacted your view of the business today. When I was in college, Mark Zuckerberg was in the class beneath me. He lived on the floor above me. I participated in Facebook, but I didn't appreciate the magnitude of what was being created on computers on the same Wi-Fi as mine. I was around there in the beginning. It was a cool thing to see because it worked so well at our school. And, and there's the arrogance of Harvard kids where they're like, well, if we're doing something, eventually everyone else is going to do it. But that actually happened with Facebook. They said, this works well. And they took it to another college. Everybody used it. And they took it to another college. Then they took it to 20 colleges at once. Then they said, let's break out of colleges. Let's take it to people that aren't in college anymore. I think it kept surprising everybody that it kept being so successful with all these different audiences. Connecting it to my own career, the private equity firm that I spent the most number of years at the beginning of my career working with, Elevation Partners, we became the first non-VC investors in Facebook. This was back in 2009 uh, or so into this category that has become very big today of pre-IPO private investing. After Elevation, I joined a colleague there to help build and scale Everlane, which was one of the very first direct consumer businesses. Everlane was founded in the same year as Instagram. And I do not think that's a coincidence. Social and being able to acquire customers to a fashion lifestyle business without a physical storefront likely would not have been possible without very prevalent social networks. When we took the brand from about 15 million in revenue up to about $100 million, I'd say not quite half, but a little less than that came through performance advertising channels. And of all the money that was spent across all the different places on the internet where you could acquire customers, about a quarter of that went to Facebook. And even just to give a sense of where the company stands today, when I left in early 2018, 
at that moment, we weren't even yet paying for anything on Instagram. Instagram was still effectively a free channel to us at that time. Now, obviously, since then, Instagram has grown quite quickly in its monetization. Over that whole period, I mean, we paid about 60 to $70 per new customer. These customers were just as good as former customers that we had. Facebook had really powerful technology of saying, give me your existing customer list. We'll obfuscate the information so we don't know exactly who they are. But then we have these things called lookalike audiences where we're able to show you all these other people that for whatever reason haven't come across your brand. But gosh, they have a lot in common with other people that have enjoyed your products. So it was a really natural way to expand the brand from purely organic growth into uh, paid and performance as well. So clearly there was a paradigm shift in the way that advertisers were able to target their customers. Historically, the television and newspapers were the primary means of advertising. And that's since evolved from a nonlinear channel to a digital one, Facebook being one of the biggest enablers of that. What exactly were the benefits of that and how did it work? The funny thing is thinking back to a a pre-social network era, I'd argue that targeted advertising never existed until the web came along. We were able to select groups based on preferences. Of course, back in the day, the best an advertiser could do would say, hey, television show or hey, uh, broadcast channel, tell me about the audience that you target. Tell me about the time of day that you can get them. And I'm going to place an ad there. This resulted in a six-year-old seeing the same beer ad that the 45-year-old that was watching the Super Bowl saw. What's the point of the six-year-old seeing that? Fast forward to post-social network era, obviously, Facebook does a much better job of weaving ads into its newsfeed experience. And I think this is one of the complaints about Facebook is that the ads are so good that the difference between the organic versus paid content begins to bleed together quite a bit. But going back to the industry segmentations that I mentioned earlier about streamed media or paid media, the reason why YouTube does such a crappier job of targeting ads to you is because it is still running that old school paid media model where all it knows is what you've watched, but it doesn't know when you're interacting with folks, how you're interacting with folks, other things that you like. It's not connecting other behavior that you have across the web. A social network, by definition, is designed to be a targeted advertising platform, as opposed to a paid media channel, which by definition is designed to attract people that are interested in that specific paid media. That's as much targeting as you're going to be able to do against that audience. And so if you kind of bottle this all up today, you've got Facebook, Blue App, you've got WhatsApp, and you've got Instagram. But people will point back to MySpace and suggest that having a social network alone is not enough. But clearly, Facebook has built something unique given the duration and the durability of its growth. What is the true competitive advantage that Facebook has today that makes that moat impenetrable? They've done a few things. We keep talking about targeted advertising ultimately being the thing that makes their business so successful. Every successful business has some little flywheel that's cooking and spinning for it. In Facebook's case, they knew how important it was to quickly become the leading social network platform. Because the bigger you are, the more data you have. The more data you have, the better targeting you can offer. The better targeting you can offer, the more effective your advertising. The more effective your advertising, the more share of ad budgets you're going to win. And then the more share of ad budgets you get, that gets you all the way back to the beginning of the wheel again. And you've got more data going into the system. So Facebook grabbed that leading position. And their approximately 85% market share of social network ad spend has been rock solid for, I mean, at least five years. What were some of the things they did to become and maintain their leadership position? I think that's changed a lot over the years. Right now, going forward, obviously, their regulatory positioning is going to be one of the things that helps solidify their position. But looking backwards, one of the first things was the frictionlessness of their self-serve ad model. So one of the things that Facebook is so good about, I don't know if you've ever personally bought an ad on Pinterest or Twitter or Snapchat and Facebook, I encourage Everybody. I mean, I've used Facebook forever. I've used it for recruiting. I've used it for customer acquisition. Their ad platform works for anything. They've invested more in their self-serve ad platform than any of their competitors. 
Facebook is the third largest CapEx spender in the S&P 500, behind only Apple and Google. They'll spend about $21 billion in CapEx this year. Their nearest social competitor, Twitter, is going to spend about a billion dollars. Setting aside any accumulated advantage that they've built over the years, this year alone, they have a 20x infrastructure advantage over their nearest competitor. And it appears, at least again, relative to that second tier of Twitter and LinkedIn, it appears that Facebook's lead is only still growing a bit over that second tier. And we'll see what happens over the third tier. Back to your original question that you know, being the biggest in a social network business where the business is targeted advertising isn't of itself their competitive advantage that they appear to be quite successful at sustaining. And I guess, how do people think about the decentralization of the internet versus these walled gardens that Google and Facebook and Apple in many ways are building? And how do you guys kind of think about that in the context of Facebook? We think a lot about decentralization. And our experience with decentralization is not so much a technological improvement as a cyclical reality. And we've seen different business models perform differently when decentralization hits their industry. So to use an example, someone that runs a store on Etsy that makes handmade candles or something, that individual in theory now has a set of very low cost tools. They have a Shopify platform. They can accept payments. They can accept money live with a square reader. They can drive traffic by going and acquiring ads on Facebook or building an organic audience. However, that candle maker will find that they're not able to generate the size of business and the margins than if they primarily ran that same product through an Etsy store. Because Etsy has aggregated the demand. They have built the search experience. I use this as an example of where, in spite of the tools being stronger than ever, I do not see decentralization having a really significant impact. Now, let's use another side of this, which is the entire financial landscape, which was traditionally regional banks with physical locations that relied on physical currency. Talk about an industry that's going to get walloped by decentralization. Where does Facebook sit in all this? Because in the future, we're all going to have neobanks, there's cryptocurrencies, we're going to be exchanging tokens when we're exchanging assets amongst each other. Eventually, real estate's going to get connected to some sort of non-fungible token. So the entire finance world is undergoing a pretty big shakeup. Where does Facebook sit in with all this? This is where Facebook's position, they have these 10 million advertisers we've talked about. They have a very diverse set of advertisers. So Facebook's looking at this as, well, we're still the place that people are going to have to come for customers. Unless someone can explain to me how the source of customer acquisition is going to get decentralized out of the place that has centralized the most amount of attention to new customers. What's happening with all of these other industries that are becoming decentralized is it's sending them to Facebook and Facebook's various properties as a customer acquisition channel. I think the last 12 months or so painted a very clear story for how flexible Facebook's platform is and much more so than Google's. When Corona first hit and the shutdowns were first happening, everyone assumed, well, ad dollars are going to dry up. Well, travel ad dollars dried up, but e-commerce ad dollars came rushing in shortly thereafter. And Facebook's revenue, when you looked at it on the headline, sure didn't look like last year had a lot of disruption in it. Google was a bit more exposed to travel. It wasn't so much they were more exposed, but it was more that they weren't as flexible to taking an ad dollars from a new industry. And they're also losing share very rapidly to Amazon. So there's other things going on there. But I thought that it represented Facebook very well as to how nimble the platform was used by different industries during a period of time when there was one of the most rapid economic shifts that was taking place. It seems like in the internet world, these kind of regime or platform shifts are when these companies are most vulnerable. And clearly, Facebook met a big task in shifting the platform from desktop to mobile and successfully navigated that shift. But it's likely in the next 5, 10, 15 years, they're going to see numerous types of form factors that they're going to have to address. How are they thinking about that today? The biggest risk for Facebook, huh? Well, this is an area where Facebook is now, I believe, the largest founder-led company in the world. 
which has its puts and takes. The good part about it is that the same person that founded and created the company is the same person that's leading it today, which gives you consistency of vision. It gives you reliability and execution. It also gives you a more honest insight than a very, call it, politicized board of directors or a management team that's fighting for a position or something like that. The reason I share that is because at times with a founder running the company, you get moments of honesty and clarity that you don't as often see from non-founder-led companies. Back in 2015, Mark wrote a letter to the team or the executive staff. At the time, they were considering an acquisition of Unity. And in it, Mark laid out a very clear explanation of where Facebook had come and how to ensure its success in the future. He was speaking specifically to the platforms that they operated on. So Facebook went from being a desktop browser-based Facebook.com platform where they were able to capture an enormous amount of market share because there were a lot of different desktops and there were a lot of different browsers. And so Facebook had a relatively strong position. Then mobile phones came along. The mobile phone ecosystem bifurcated into Apple phones or Android phones. This put the world in a position where now Apple and Google got to be gatekeepers to the real estate that was happening on these screens. When Facebook first went public back in 2012, and there were concerns about whether or not they would be able to successfully transition to mobile, Facebook had concluded, well, to be successful on mobile, we're going to need more apps than we had on the desktop. And they bought Instagram, they bought WhatsApp. And so in order to have a similar position that they had on the desktop browser, they now needed to have three different apps within the mobile ecosystem to get there. So as he's laying this out, he's making it very clear that whatever the platform, if one shows up after mobile, that shift and how Facebook navigates that shift is the most existential threat to the company. Because if mobile operating system, in the way that mobile operating systems got built without Facebook being a critical piece of the infrastructure, if an event like that happens again, Facebook will continue to lose strategic priority within the platform which it's operating. So Facebook is working very hard to invest in, well, what comes after the Apple, Google, App Store ecosystems? And at the time, back in 2015, their speculation was, well, it has something to do in the augmented reality or virtual reality worlds. And they've remained steadfastly behind that commitment. They've been investing significantly in Oculus. Oculus is without question the leading physical VR hardware that's out there today. They've been lowering the cost pretty darn quickly because the view of the company is at a minimum, even if they don't find a way to monetize this third platform, so long as they are a critical part of the infrastructure of the platform that comes after mobile, they will be able to ensure that Facebook's position within it remains competitive. It's difficult talking about such a large and nebulous risk to a company, but the fact that you've got the founder still running the company, thinking about it all the time, I'm willing to bet that Mark Zuckerberg knows what the third platform is going to be before I ever figure it out. And so it seems like Google has their other bets, divisions, and Microsoft does all types of experimentation and acquisition. And even Apple has certain platforms and hardware that they tend to tinker with and introduce new products. Facebook also has a collection of assets that I think would present optionality. You know, what are those that investors are most excited about? When Constructing the future of Facebook, I think it's helpful to separate their core business, some of the new businesses that they're building, as well as this third nebulous platform thing that I just shared. So first, let's focus on their core business. Facebook and Instagram are their cash cows. I'll take a little bit of a departure for a moment to talk about how those two platforms are performing around the world. So I mentioned that Facebook is about as prevalent outside of the United States as it is uh, in the United States. And if you look at the company's revenue, they're actually growing about the same internationally as they are in the US. The makeup of that growth is a bit different though, because it has been well documented that Facebook in the United States, the traditional Facebook blue app.com is a slowing asset. However, Instagram is growing so quickly that when you cobble those two together, growth in the United States still looks great. 
If you go outside of the United States, it's a little bit of a similar story, but to a less extreme degree where Facebook blue is still growing, but Instagram's on fire everywhere, but Facebook is still finding lots of opportunities and pockets for growth uh, throughout. So those two businesses still have very long runways. So some of the new things that Facebook is doing is both strengthening and monetizing those platforms further. So Facebook Marketplace, Shops, Instagram Commerce, those are ways to further monetize the strength of their existing network. I'm also going to bring the streaming media component back here because TikTok is getting a heck of a lot of attention right now, which is in the streaming media category. Now that Facebook is competing here with the scrolling short videos, Facebook is putting a toe in the water of paying creators for content. I think That is the angle that could change the look and feel and experience of the Instagram and Facebook platforms the most if Facebook were to become more successful in the paid creator media segment. It's an experiment today. TikTok is just so damn successful, you can't ignore it. So I think that is the area where we might be surprised by the amount of change we see over the next few years. So that's their core business. WhatsApp is close to their core business in that it is used as an encrypted communications platform, but it's different in that Facebook isn't operating it like a traditional social network and blattering ads all over it yet. Clearly, Facebook has had a couple of stops and starts with how they're going to monetize the WhatsApp ecosystem. They have previewed that they have 50 million business users on it. So I think they're teasing that it may become more of an enterprise-like product as opposed to a traditional social network-like product. And that would mean building features like payments, customer service, the mini apps within the app. So they're viewing it more as a potential super app of services and tools as opposed to social network. But again, that could change. It's not something that's making a lot of money right now. My potential speculation for WhatsApp Coming back to the beginning of the conversation for a second, we talked about the 10 million advertisers on Facebook and they add about a million advertisers every year. Facebook could run WhatsApp as a customer acquisition funnel to their core business and say, you know what? It's really tricky to monetize this WhatsApp ecosystem without pissing off users. So you know what? We're going to run this thing at cost, but we're going to use it as a very high quality funnel into our other core business. When you're ready to scale your business, we've got an ad platform for you. That's my personal maybe on WhatsApp. And then the third piece, which is coming back to what the potential future platforms of Facebook might be, whether it's Oculus, Plays and VR and AR, you're hearing Boz talk a lot about getting into workplace collaboration because their view is if they nail VR and, and AR communication, why shouldn't they nail it as much in enterprise communications as they do in individual and private conversations? So there's a lot to clearly wax philosophical about where Facebook can go with its various pieces, but that's how we break up the components. The thing that always I found interesting about Facebook is it's kind of the one place on the internet where everyone has their real world alias in parallel to their digital world alias, as opposed to all these other social platforms where there's anonymous, pseudo-anonymous message boards. And as a function of that, they have all types of information on you and who you are explicitly. And there's that old adage, you know, if you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product, which if there's any criticism of Facebook, that's the key point that they're over monetizing their users and they're not providing value-added service. How do you kind of respond to the belief that Facebook is abusing the power they have as this massive social network? I think it's useful to look at history here a little bit. Again, we have a founder-like company with the same founder that's been running it the whole time. The original culture of the company was move fast and break things. Even though they've stopped saying that and have publicly said they've walked away from it, the same guy is still running the place. So I believe that Facebook continues to move fast and continues to break things until it's not founder run anymore. Now, looking back, I remember a time not so long ago, this was early when Zynga was really catching fire, where Zynga had basically found a way to manipulate the Facebook newsfeed. The Facebook newsfeed used to be predominantly ads for getting into Farmville. It sucked. People started to walk away from Facebook. There were a lot of people that 
didn't care about Farmville and were getting really annoyed at all the promotions that they were running to get you to download the app and play the game and ultimately spend money. This was not a government regulated issue, but Facebook acknowledged it. They were making a lot of money from these gaming sites advertising on their platform and they shut it down. And they said, you're not allowed to run these types of promotions for these types of games anymore. And it's going to suck for our revenue for a bit, but that's okay. We're doing the right things for our platform long-term. So it is a crude but related analogy to how the Facebook platforms got taken over by political campaigns over the past handful of years. It is clear that there has been a raft of misinformation that has been proliferated across platforms by any and all and interested parties and things like that. It's a much bigger problem to solve because Facebook is a much bigger company today than it was when it was just having to deal with Farmville advertisements. So I view it as a much more complicated version of that problem where all of society is now involved and the government's going to get involved and they're going to make rules around social network and social network advertising. They're going to be careful about the full extent of those rules because clearly social networks are very powerful tools for politicians to use when they're running their campaigns. So I think there's a great negotiation that is taking place between the public, the government, and the company. But I have no reason to believe that Facebook's intentions are to ruin the world. So I think the natural response is if you kind of look at the cash cow businesses of Facebook today, recognizing that WhatsApp is hardly, if at any, monetized, you have a $100 billion revenue business. But to the extent that they can integrate these businesses into something more powerful than they are independent of one other, it kind of makes me think of the super apps that are successful in China. But to date... It doesn't really seem like Facebook has made an effort to establish themselves as a super app. So A, is that something that you think is in the product roadmap? And B, is it feasible in Western culture? I like that you asked the question, because for me to portray Facebook and Instagram simply as cash cows to fund other initiatives at Facebook's is probably a gross misrepresentation of the potential of those two platforms. I think Facebook has operated both of those assets at least has attempted to operate them as super apps. But you've had more competition from other places in Western internet platforms than you've had in China. So it's an exercise I always enjoy doing. When you open up the Facebook app, you look at the five or six icons across the bottom. Then you map out what's the addressable market of each one of these apps across the bottom. And the Facebook one isn't as good because there's your news feed, there's a search function, there's find other friends, there's marketplaces, which is really cool and is catching on and is finally putting a nail in Craigslist because now you have verified identities on Facebook selling stuff as opposed to strangers. But Instagram is really where stuff is cooking because they've got, there's news feed, they've got a search bar, they've got the TikTok competitor They've got shopping. And what's fascinating about shopping is that even more so than marketplace, where your supply is constrained by what things people are willing to resell, commerce on Instagram is all of the brands that many of whom have built themselves on Instagram. And now the transaction experience can happen inside the app itself. When you think about whether or not Instagram and Facebook are super apps, I think they are already super apps. It's just a question of how far can they go and what might those icons be replaced with in the future to make those apps even more powerful. I think the most obvious omission is payments. Cash App, Venmo, why are these social peer-to-peer payments things happening on other platforms outside of Facebook and Instagram? And I think there were some hiccups with the Libra program. There are hiccups with Facebook getting involved in cryptocurrency and people being confused as to whether or not they ought to have a place there. But I think it's only a matter of time until there's a place within my Instagram app where I can send cash, send crypto, send Facebook shares, and exchange that with other users on the platform. So kind of in summation, Facebook has built out an ecosystem and a network that's incredibly complex, highly entrenched, and enables a number of independent businesses and entities to not just connect with their customers, but to create value for the entire platform. If you were kind of put it all together and explain what Facebook is today and where it's going, how would you do that? Well, I'd come back to where we started. You got 3 billion people all over the world, except for China, using some collection of their services. 
within the next handful of years, that number is going to be 4 billion. So no matter what you read in what piece of media, there are only more people using more services from Facebook over time than there are people defecting from them. On the business side of it, as I mentioned, there's 10 million advertisers today. We talked about the 50 million business users on WhatsApp. Facebook counts about 200 million business users that are using some combination of their free tools. There are 200 million businesses out there with something greater than zero and something less than 10 million of revenue that are fighting to develop a product or a service that organically matters to some target customer group. And some number of those businesses are going to break out and they're going to be in a position where they're going to be excited and ready to scale. And I am not, as a business builder, I am not seeing other places to allocate that capital to acquire customers as effectively. I think it's really that simple. I loved Rob's framing of Facebook's position today as it simultaneously highlighted the scale and the runway that still exists for the core business. To dive deeper into Facebook's ad business, I'm joined by Jesse Puji, whose time in performance marketing as the founder of Ampush makes him ideal to pull back the curtain. Great, Jesse, thanks for joining us today to break down Facebook, the business model. You have tons of experience in this space. I'm so excited to talk about Facebook's advertising business today with you. And so when you think of digital advertising as a concept, there are obviously a lot of places that an advertiser could spend their money. The perception is that Facebook is one of the most effective places for advertisers to do so. Why is it that Facebook has been able to build such an effective advertising engine? We think of the holy triangle of digital marketing as there's basically three vectors. There's scale, there's cost, and there's quality or lifetime value of a customer. In a true way, there's really only two platforms that can deliver all three of the, the triangle, and they're Google and Facebook. And in aggregate, other publishers can do it, and there's other strategies you can leverage that could potentially deliver those three things. And let's just go back to the history of the internet for one quick second, Zach. So history of the internet, people start making web pages. Let's just make it up. A hundred web pages pop up overnight. You're Coca-Cola and you want to start running ads across these things. Well, you're not going to call a hundred websites or if they're calling you. You're like, I don't want to deal with this. And so the V0.1 of internet advertising were these things called ad networks, which were essentially middlemen who said, hey, Coca-Cola, give me a million dollars. I'll go find the hundred websites you should be running your ads on and I'll run display ad impressions. And in the early days, the pricing model was singular. It was per impression. It was what I'm buying, I'm selling. Then somebody came along, some awesome entrepreneur and said, I don't think impressions are that valuable. I think we should charge for clicks. And so then they went to an advertiser and said, you know what? You don't have to pay me for an impression. I'll take the risk. I want clicks to occur from you. So you only have to pay me for every click that I generate. And then they went to the publishers and they either went to the publishers and said, well, I'll pay you on an impression and I'll take the risk that I'm putting the right ad on the right site that's going to generate clicks. Or sometimes they just went to the advertiser and said, no, I'm only going to pay you for clicks also. And then everyone said, well, we better make sure that people are clicking on these ads. And then that continued to move forward. And someone said, oh, let's do it only on a customer actually buying something. And that's like what a CPA, that's like what affiliate is. Or someone said, okay, I'll pay you for every customer that gets done. But oftentimes in the internet, including on Facebook, people pay on an impression, but they value on an acquisition. An acquisition meaning a customer signing up for a product or service. That's how the internet started innovating on display. And then Google search came along and sort of changed the game, right? And here's a way where you could give me a specific keyword like office desk or new Apple computer. And there was tons of demand because you were searching for it or auto insurance or mortgage, or those are kind of the early verticals. And that became a marketplace just for the keywords. I could bid on it and I paid per click. If I bought someone searched mortgage, new mortgage in St. Louis, I could buy that keyword. I could pay $5 for it. If I got a hundred clicks, that would cost me $500. But if out of those 100 clicks, I got five leads, so meaning five people signed up to learn, that would cost me $50 per lead. And then if I called 100 of those leads and it turned into one sale, two sales, that means my cost per sale would be $2,500, which you make $10,000 usually when you do a mortgage loan, roughly, let's say, as a broker. That was a great deal. That was like the Quicken Loans of the world. Some of the earliest internet advertisers, Lending Tree popped up around that business model. And the cost per click, it was a very elegant system for organizing it. And until 2011, 2012, there was not another system other than those two display ads and display networks and then Google search essentially. 
And Facebook came along and in the early days, they allowed for audience targeting, which was really effective. Over time, what they realized was the same algorithm they use to prioritize content in people's news feeds. So I don't want to see every single picture. If I haven't thought about my ex-girlfriend in 10 years, I don't really want to see her pictures, even though we're still Facebook friends. I want to see my brother's kids' pictures. And they learned that based on my behavior, my usage, based on other signals that they could observe. And Facebook realized, huh, it started with, let's put ads in the newsfeed. Then it became, because the newsfeed's great real estate. And if you remember, in 2011, their ads were on the right rail of the desktop. And then they said, no, I'll throw them in the newsfeed. And I, I was there. I, immediately they started performing. And, and the answer was, question was why? Well, you're putting a huge ad in front of someone's face in the middle of the thing they're looking at. Of course, it's going to perform. But then they went in the next level and said, you know, what if we use the same technology that we use to prioritize content in your feed to prioritize advertising? And we really think about what signals matter, what's working, what's not. And so you, know, you now had a new form of scale, which was They had a lot of audience. They had a lot of scale just because a lot of people using it. So that's the first part of the triangle. The cost was at that kind of scale, if I can find the right person and put the right message in front of them at the right time, they're going to click and engage, which then lowers the overall cost for them. And then Facebook is generally thought of as a high quality, just like Google, it's a very high quality set of audience. So you get high revenue producing customers. So that's kind of like the internet history, advertising history 101 combined with Facebook as a why it works. It's big. It knows a lot about these people and their behavior. So it's able to put the right ad in front of the right person at the right time. And its audience is of a quality that when they buy something, they tend to stick around or they tend to be high quality. So Jesse, most people understand the customer experience as avid users of Facebook and its suite of products. But from the advertiser's perspective, it's tougher for an outsider looking in to appreciate. Can you kind of just walk us through how an advertiser uses Facebook's advertising product? It's important to remember, and I think this is what I'll come back to this later, is that most people start with the sense of a budget of how many dollars they want to spend. They don't start by thinking of CPMs, how much dollars can I spend and how many customers do I need for that to make sense for my business? If I'm selling online mattresses, it's a little mini case study. I sell them for $1,000. I make $600 off them. Maybe I'm willing to spend $300 on a customer for those mattresses to generate a profit for myself. In that case... I go, okay, well, I'm I'm a new company. I'll spend $10,000 this month. I need to get 30 mattresses sold. That's the math that I'm doing as an advertiser on my side. I go to the platform. I will set up targeting. Easy framework is the who, what, when, where, how. So who is people who've indicated sleep as an interest or insomnia as a thing that's sort of popped up in their profile? Or is it just a lookalike of certain audiences I know? Or am I just going to target it broad to start with? I kind of pick one of those categories And then I come up with a few ads and I go, one shows a person looking really tired and saying, man, I wish I had a new mattress. The other one says discount today available. I try different creatives. And then I send those to different landing pages that try to sell the product. And so that's almost like what an advertiser... And I say, here's my budget, Facebook. Here's my target goal I'm trying to accomplish. And in the old days, it used to be, they didn't care about your goal. They didn't understand it. Now they actually take your goal and they try to fill the ad in your inventory that your budget you're willing to spend for that certain price. And you go into, there's an interface that a lot of people haven't seen that looks like a spreadsheet, essentially, that you go in and upload all these ads and these combinations and you hit a button that says go and they start showing those ads to their user base. And then you start to see how many impressions, how many people saw my ad, how many people clicked on my ad, how many people purchased my product. As an advertiser, you go, well, I spent $1,000. Did I sell at least three or four mattresses? If not, let me pause, let me stop spending money and let me try some different ad combination. Let me try to find out. And you're searching for that combination. They're also trying to put you in front of the right people to sell your product. And there's sort of this interaction going on that grows it. When it works, I'm selling a mattress for 250 a pop. I want to spend as much money as I can <laughs> because that's going to drive my business forward. And so if they found that winning combination of right ad in front of the right person at the right time, I'm actually going to put more just nominal dollars onto the platform. And if you just think of it as the same inventory, the CPMs for a bunch of people doing that simultaneously, the CPMs will go up. Rising CPMs are actually a positive signal that the marketplace that advertisers are finding value in the marketplace because they're consistently willing to pay more for a specific impression. It means that the matching of right place to right person at the right time is working. And it's worth spending a minute on auctions. So there's an underlying auction mechanism taking place here. Again, think of it like a auction you've seen on a movie, right? There's one person selling a product and everyone's going, oh, I'll pay 50 for it. I'll pay 55. Anyone? 60, 65, 60, 70. Google's a more straightforward auction. There's a keyword. 
they're willing to auction off the spot for it. It's called a second price auction, which means if I'm willing to pay a dollar and you're willing to pay 50 cents, I will pay 51 cents and I'll be above you. So I don't actually pay my bid. I pay one penny above the next highest bid. That's called a second price auction. Facebook has a different auction, which I won't go into all the dynamics, called a VCG auction. And I can't remember the three people's names who that stands for, but it's a different auction where everyone displays their willingness to pay and the auctioneer decides what the optimal outcome is for everybody in that situation. It's known as a VCG auction. It takes everyone's willingness to pay what their dollars are, how much they're willing to spend, and it sort of allocates it out in an optimized fashion. And that's sort of the core of Facebook, I think, switched to that in 2013. They started as a second price auction like Google. So the auction mechanic is also very important for allocating the right inventory to the right advertiser at the right time. And these things all work together to generate the results that all these amazing amount of revenue that comes from Facebook's advertising. So taking a step back, I think about Facebook's advertising product is a a highly liquid, highly efficient marketplace at this point. And so if you were to take a step further and think about that in the context of how the internet advertising market continues to get more and more efficient, there's still variation in, in the cost per impression at any given time. It seems like some months there'll be highly profitable or the revenue per impression will be super high for Facebook and other months. What is the dynamic that's impacting bidding on certain keywords or customers? How does that work? Well, let's zoom out kind of at a high level. Facebook has a supply of inventory. Pre-Facebook stories and Instagram stories, that supply was relatively fixed. It was huge. No larger supply on the internet, but it was growing at, I don't know, 5-10%. It wasn't growing that fast. Stories obviously changed that because Anytime they can introduce a new form of inventory, that's a massive opportunity for them and for the internet at large, frankly. But let's just live in a world just for the sake of argument that impression volume is fixed. Advertiser demand at a certain price for their product is unlimited. It's insatiable, right? So if I'm a contact lens subscription, I'll pay, I'm making up numbers, $50. If I'm a meal kit, I'll pay $150. If I'm a mattress company, I'll pay $300. I'll take as much inventory for that price as you can give me. And so if you think about the supply demand curve, there's a term in between supply and demand. It's not pure supply and demand, which is, which essentially is yield, which is how well can Facebook take their inventory and put it in front of the right person at the right place at the right time. And the extent to which they can do that, they'll be able to generate a better and higher CPM. There's always a fun question of how high could that CPM go? One of my favorite thought exercises is like, we work with some auto insurance businesses and they're happy to pay $1,000 for a policy. You give them a policy, they'll pay $1,000, assuming the person's legit and reasonable credit profile, all that stuff. Wave a magic wand and deliver 1,000 impressions to the exact right people who like this auto insurance, Pooji's auto insurance, and they love my auto insurance company already and I know that somehow, and they all need a policy right now because they're all buying a car at a car dealership. And my click-through rate was 100%. And my conversion rate was 100%. So 1,000 impressions translates into 1,000 policies. What would I be willing to pay for that CPM? I'd be willing to pay a million dollars for those 1,000 impressions. One of the frameworks to think about Facebook is, well, what is the global click-through rate and conversion rate? And global, I don't mean country global. I mean, like, what is the overall click-through rate and conversion rate of all their media running broadly? And for an individual campaign, you can see a very sensitive thing to CPM. And so to answer your question, I think, they're constantly calibrating that algorithm. And there's a lot of ways to drive that yield. Creative, hey, if a video tends to engage me more than a static image, well, that's going to drive up their CPM because all their CPM is a reflection of how well they're matching the supply and demand on their platform. And so creative that new targeting tools that match people better will do that. Sometimes we just wake up in the morning and we see that it just performs better. And that, that continues because maybe they, somebody put a code shift in the algorithm and all of a sudden it's getting better at matching the right person to the right product at the right time. And so the extent to which they can do that and continue to improve that, as well as the overall ecosystem continuing to improve, right? When Instagram stories launched, at first they didn't really perform for anybody. Well, someone woke up and said, well, you're not making creative that actually fits this format. And the second people started making it more creative, like it felt native to that. Wow. It started to perform. Their systems work in concert with the ecosystem of what creative and agencies and all these people are doing to build this kind of machine that keeps getting better and smarter over time. So around Facebook's advertising, there's a pretty robust ecosystem of businesses that are being built, not just to target customers, but also to facilitate that. And you participate in that in some ways with your business. Can we spend a little time talking about the types of businesses that are being built 
on the advertising rails of Facebook to make it an even more effective medium of advertisement? The easiest mental way to think about that is start with the customers. I'm a direct-to-consumer brand that's Harry's or make up your favorite one, Casper, or I'm Anheuser Bush, or I'm a marketer. And now I want to engage with as many people as I can. And if I'm a brand marketer, I care about scale of eyeballs and I want as many eyeballs for as low a dollar as I can. If I'm a direct response marketer and I'm saying high level here, I want as many customers for every dollar I can spend. I know Facebook's a great way to do that. Just in starting to do that, lots of problems pop up for me. So let's just start with the original problem, which is what Ampush was started on was, I don't know how to run a Facebook ad. I've never even heard of that thing before. What is it? Isn't that the thing my kid uses all the time? That was a conversation in 2011. Okay, great. We're a specialty firm. We have technology. We have services people. We have creative. We have everything you need to solve this problem. Great. That was one. But then as the scale grew, there started to be all kinds of other people. Well, tracking exactly how these people are moving around in your mobile app and attributing it back to the right place, that's a problem. Okay, a whole set of analytics platforms popped up. So there's a whole set of software out there that connects data effectively across your marketing stack, as well as horizontally and vertically in your marketing stack. That's a whole segment of things. Then there became like specialty creative companies. So there's companies like Tube Science, for example, where they said, you know, the only thing that actually matters on Facebook is really good creative. So we're going to go figure out, and they've hired a bunch of actors and people who are sort of in Hollywood and said, just record these really like UGC videos on, they're going to do a really great job. The way they get paid is, you get to determine how much of their creative you use and how much media you spend, and you only pay them for the stuff you're using against your media. So it's kind of like a specialty creative firm that does that. Influencer has become a big segment of the market there because people are following people. There's companies that are softwares to manage your influencers. There's companies that help you recruit influencers. There's companies that help you make your influencers make effective creative on Facebook. So like every little iteration you can imagine of that pops up. There's companies now that are helping people share custom audiences. So my audience works for me, your audience works for you. What if we just share and swap audiences and run our ads to each other's audiences? They like contact lenses, they might like razors. Let's try both of those and let's see if it works. And there's marketplaces that exist for sort of that kind of stuff, that data. And the list goes on. I mean, that wasn't the most structured answer, but the idea is like anything that can solve this problem of putting the right message in front of the right person at the right time, you're going to see some sort of a firm or capability pop up around it. But when you're thinking about Facebook's ability to target its users, it'd be impossible to kind of avoid the grill in the room being their relationship with Apple. And recently, there have been some changes in their ability to track their users across different applications. And it's referred to as the changes in IDSA. How has Facebook benefited from its ability to kind of see what you're doing? and What kind of data do they really have? You know, there's a lot of concern about what they can see and what they can't see. Yeah, the most common refrain you hear, which is basically totally wrong or highly manipulated is Facebook sells your data. And anytime someone says that to me at a cocktail party, I'm like, you're not that interesting. Nobody wants your data. Anything that Facebook does is way more benevolent than what direct mail people did 20 years ago. You know, what actually happens is we all exist inside a Facebook system in a segment. Nobody's individually trying to find us. I might exist. Okay, I live in St. Louis between 30 and 40. I like the St. Louis Cardinals all these explicit signals I've given Facebook about myself, which obviously they know and they're out there. Then there's a bunch of things I don't tell them explicitly, but they can see like, well, I'm a father. I either have marked that somewhere or the kind of ways I engage, they could probably guess that. And that's all the stuff I do on their site. They can see when I slow down and I spend more time on a certain creative they're showing me in an ad or a certain segment of a thing or what I write. They're able to look at all that. Again, not in a Jesse Puji is doing this, but in, hey, this are all the people in our system who have slowed down on a meal kit ad, or these are all the people who have written the word, my kid is great. They're not, again, individually identifying me, but in aggregate, they're saying this is a segment of people who do that. And then there was the Facebook pixel and tracking sort of on the third party internet. Again, segments of people who's been on these websites. Wow, Jesse's been to five realtor websites. Maybe he's looking for a house. And again, I say Jesse, but it's like this group of people, there's a group of people who I don't know their names. They don't know my name explicitly. I'm in a hash, I'm a number basically, and a bunch of numbers and all these bunch of numbers in a system that no human being is looking at, by the way. These are all people who visited lots of realtor sites. These are all people who've been to lots of meal kit websites. These are people who bought mattresses in the last month. And there are all these segments, millions, billions, probably of segments of groupings of people that exist inside of their system somewhere. And that information is not being sold, but that information is used to deliver relevant advertising 
to people as they scroll through Facebook and Instagram. So, oh, yeah, I'm part of those 10 segments. So they're going to show me ads that match my segments. And they're going to then see how I engage with those ads. Do I scroll right by him? Maybe we thought he was in that segment, but he's not. And again, not he, but maybe these group of people are not really in that segment. Let's move them on. To go back to your original question, Zach, the IDFA thing made it very convenient and easy. Your Apple phone gives you an ID. Again, it's a number. And that number could easily connect to Facebook's number. And in that number, it's easy to understand what you're doing, how your site's working, what activities you take. Not on your phone. They don't get that information. But it gave a common denominator that everyone in the ecosystem could use. Facebook could use it. The mobile game you're playing could use it. Apple could use it. And everyone could easily connect. And think of it as just like connection mechanism. And now that connection mechanism has been severed. It's just no longer there. So now what I believe is going to happen is lots of workarounds are going to pop up. They go, well, I can't use this thing, but I can use another ID that's going to still identify you from Facebook, identify you in my system from maybe one of these third-party software companies. And then the game also has an ID that they can give you. Or I click to your website. I ask for your email as the first thing. Now I know your email, you've given it to me. I can attribute that to this other Facebook thing you've gotten. And I think what's not clear is to what extent Apple is going to fully sever Facebook's ability to track like on the broad internet versus on mobile apps. It's not clear that anybody knows and exactly how that's going to play out, but it's definitely harder for mobile apps to track. Whether it's going to be harder on the mobile web or not is not fully clear. The second one would be a bigger deal for Facebook than the first one. Can we spend a little bit of time talking about what it means to be able to kind of compare the identifiers across different apps? To use an example, on my phone, I may have Angry Birds, I have Facebook, I've got Instagram, I have Uber, let's call it. Clearly, my Apple identifier tracks me across all four or five of those apps. Historically, what could Facebook learn from those interactions versus what could they potentially not learn until they figure out the workaround? Let's just stick with apps for a second, like you said, not talk about websites because websites are a different can of worms. If I had the Facebook SDK, if I'm a marketer, if I'm Uber or these gaming, and I had Facebook's code in my app, which is SDK, Software Developer Kit, sitting in my app and multiple of those existed in my app and I use them in a certain way, that information, assuming it's in terms of service and all these things, some apps it might not be, it would flow its way back again in aggregate to Facebook systems and they'd go, oh, this person loves ride sharing. They use it all the time. And again, it's a high level like ride sharing user, person who likes ride sharing. Now, again, there's other things that they can do that the famous one I love to talk about is the debunk is Facebook's listening to me. They're listening to us, their microphones. Oh my gosh, I had talked to my friend about this. And the next thing I know, I saw an ad for it. So let me tell you what I believe is actually happening there. They're able to get that information back from Uber and these other SDKs. As long as you're using their app, they know where you are. They know when you're near another person. And so what actually ends up happening with the conversation is you and I go get lunch, Zach. They know that for an hour in the middle of the day, our phones were next to each other. And again, they don't know that they're us, but they know that these two phones with these two profiles were next to each other. During the course of our conversation, you and I have been browsing things the last 10 days. I've been browsing 10 things. You've been browsing 10 things. The chances that one of them come up in our conversation is extremely high. Check out this new skateboard. Man, I'm so excited about the skateboard, blah, blah, blah. You don't even have to whip out your phone because you've been looking at skateboard websites. So then they just go, yeah, let's give this a try. These two phones were next to each other for a really long time. Some of the stuff you were browsing, why don't I show it to Jesse? And let's see if he engages with it. Now, if we talked about it and then I see it, then of course my conclusion is, oh my God, they must have listened to our conversation. And they're not actually, there's no microphone on. They're not parsing our words. They just know what you looked at. They know what I looked at. We sit for lunch and then they go, let me try to show these guys stuff that they've each been looking at with the chance that they, that happened. And the chance, by the way, that leads to a high conversion. You might've told me about something. Now there's nine other things you looked at it didn't come up in our conversation that may also show up in my newsfeed, but I wouldn't attribute them to our conversation because we didn't discuss it. I'm not 100% sure that's what it works, but I'm 90, 80, 90% sure that's what's going on when people think Facebook's listening to them. But it's fascinating in the juxtaposition of the way that advertising used to be able to reach us. If you think about the experience on television or in a newspaper, it was pretty much spray and pray. You knew that the NFL was watched primarily by demographic from 20 to 45 year old men. And if you wanted to advertise for Viagra, it seemed like a good place to target. Obviously, now with the information we have, we can make advertising a lot more relevant. 
But the way that we spend our time and attention on the internet is also shifting. So Facebook is going to start to see more and more competition from other apps and internet websites. What is the state of play in the landscape of competition for digital advertising today? Kind of goes back to the first principles that we just discussed early on, which is that triangle and who can make it. And a lot of that starts with, there's these emails that have been floating around about the Instagram acquisition and how astute Zuckerberg was to go, you know what, this thing is growing and it's kind of hit this threshold. We should buy it. We should buy it because it's a good app that it, once you have that network effect, it's very hard to peel people off that, which he knew because he built a version of that with Facebook. The money in advertising pretty simply follows the scale of the players. And all of it just ties back to the first principles of how many people use your app, how much time is spent in the app, and how many impressions are being generated. So you could draw a straight line between usage and scale and what an advertiser cares about. I care a lot more about Facebook and Instagram than I do about Pinterest, for example. And really, the way people approach these things in, as a marketer is Facebook, Google, all this other stuff I'll test, affiliate, maybe some other stuff like email, but those are the categories. Like Facebook is most of these D2C brands and a lot of companies that are doing direct response, it's anywhere from 40 to 70% of its revenue comes from Facebook. And by the way, inside of their Facebook campaign, 60% of their scale comes from like one create, one ad creative that seems to be resonating in the marketplace. Is that at any given time or has that just happened to be? That's more like in the early stages of growing and scaling. As you get bigger, you get better at testing and diversifying away from that. But it's not dissimilar from, you know, again, television, we talk about it. We could probably quote some of our favorite Super Bowl ads from 20, like the Budweiser frog ad. So it's not that dissimilar from what used to happen in certain mediums of advertising. But yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The competitive landscape is Facebook, Google, everybody else. And the way that those guys will break through is not has almost nothing to do with advertising. And Twitter might be one exception to that, but has everything to do with scale of their platforms, both in terms of users as well as time spent. So if you were to map out a scenario where the Facebook advertising business is no longer as strong as it is today, what would have to play out to make that a reality? The easiest thing is people stop using their apps. And by the way, this has been tested because I've been on calls from Wall Street for the last five years about this. And they go, there's all this bad press and this came up and the data thing. Anything going on with the ads? Nope. Any advertiser spending less money? Not really. And then even like last year, there was that boycott. I've never seen a more tentative, hesitant boycott in my life where people are like, yeah, we probably shouldn't be on Facebook for this month because people are like, but does, are you sure no one's going to be on it? And like, okay, fine, let's pause our budgets. But every CMO that I know was like, let's save the money for later in the year. For July, we're going to go offline. And so they live in a world where everybody needs them more than they need anybody. Well, it's a $100 billion top line business. And I think their biggest advertiser, it's somewhat out there in the internet is probably like spending 100 to $200 million a year. So their largest customer is 0.1 to 0.2% of their business. It's just crazy to think about that. To go back to your sort of bear quake case question, it's people stop using their app. That is the real thing that would drive or regulate it out of existence in the sense that all of a sudden like targeted advertising or any sort of data being used in advertising on the internet is no longer allowed. That would kill them, but it would certainly impact their revenues very meaningfully. Those are probably the two most obvious scenarios. People, it's not cool anymore. Some other app beats it. Hard to imagine, but like AOL once was the big thing, right? And so Facebook, Instagram, and they've done a fantastic job of buying the next thing, generally speaking, and fueling it with the right resources and all that. Or somehow regulation gets into play and screws up their ability to work. And for what it's worth, the second one, I don't think will happen because customers and consumers, as much as people talk about it and politicians talk about it, nobody cares. It's just a nuisance. It's annoying. But if people actually cared about this and actually didn't want relevant advertising, we would know very fast. We'd actually figure that out. We don't even need regulation. The marketplace, in my opinion, the marketplace would speak for itself and say, I don't like this. I don't want to use this app. But if anything, the marketplace, both for customers, users, and advertisers has told us the exact opposite, which is like, I don't care what the press says. I'm going to keep using this thing. So inversely, it seems like the thing that's the most positive for Facebook would be the ability to get people to spend more time in their app. And historically, it hasn't seemed like commerce or the ability to transact has been a focus of Facebook. But it's clear that they're starting to offer more tools for businesses to actually use the rails of Facebook to buy and sell. And when you think about the relevance for direct response, it could be a tremendous opportunity. 
How do you think that commerce plays into Facebook's story today? As you said, a massive opportunity for upside for them. There's sort of like three pieces to it that I think are very meaningful. So the first one is, if you go back to the math equation in my example of the the million dollar CPM, the more you can bring it on platform, presumably, then more you can control if you're Facebook, the higher click through and higher conversion you can generate. Why? It's just less friction. I don't have to click to a totally new experience. My browser window doesn't have to open up. It can be instantaneous. I can shop it fast. There's this famous stat about Amazon, but it's true for every website that I think for every like millisecond, their site loads faster. It means 10,000 in sales. Same thing is true for click-throughs and conversions. The faster all of it happens, the faster... All, so that's one version of it. But even the creative things you could do, it no longer has to feel so linear where you see an ad, you click an ad, then you go to a website. Maybe there's a single click and then that immerses you in an experience. But all of that allows them to improve yield per impression. And the higher you can get yield per impression, the higher overall... CPMs generates and more volume and lower lower cost customers that an advertiser generates. And it generates that win, win, win. So that's number one. Number two is this whole tracking thing. In some ways, if they can keep you all on site, it's not really an issue. The signals that they use from you, it's all their first party data. So if they're no longer relying on third party data, either from advertisers or having to go through orifices like Apple, great. They can see all the data, they can manage all the data, so on and so forth. They can control it. And so... I think that's a secondary and very important point. The third thing is that I think it allows them to create more options for solving industry and customer problems. The most obvious one for the whole Shopify landscape today is discovery. Amazon has this thing of like, they're getting bigger than Google now in terms of where people start their search for commerce and they're building it into a monetized engine. I think I asked this question on Twitter the other day of like, what's the actual GMV of Facebook? Have you thought of it the same way you thought of Amazon? Is it 100 billion? Is it like how much sales are actually flowing through their pipes? Well, there's all these interesting tools and capabilities that you'd like to have as a customer, as a human. What are the top five Shopify sellers of silverware? And it allows Facebook to innovate and build another meta layer on top of what they already have that will serve, I think, all marketplace participants better. So to me, if you're them strategically, it's a high priority. And by the way, that's one vertical we should keep in mind. There are others. I mean, Facebook Marketplace is now quietly the best place to sell something like it's beating Craigslist. There's auto, there's travel. And those things, you have to think of those. If you're a bull on Facebook, you have to think of those things as very, very basic experiments that are taking place. We've sold our couch on it, sold a secondary lease to a car. Like I had a car that has a lease. They have the systems. Oh, is this a real car? Give me your VIN number. It's just the beginnings of like, man, they could have an auto marketplace. Why couldn't they, right? So again, if you're a bull, you're in the second innings of this whole thing and things flowing through it with real identity, with all these other things that people have been talking about forever about Facebook. It's interesting when John Malone was asked to reflect on Netflix, he talked about the fact that they had your payment information. And once you have the payment information, you essentially win. Cable for years had a recurring payment from their customers. And to date, Facebook hasn't made an explicit effort in getting your payment information or even doing much in the way of payments at all. And so to your point around Marketplace and Auto and some of these shopping experiences on Instagram, once they have access to your wallet, it really does seem like it could potentially change the dynamics around everything. Yeah, I don't see why not. And biggest challenge if you go to the bear case is like, people use them every day and people don't trust them. And I think them reflecting on that and thinking about how to build that trust, almost like from a PR perspective, would be incredibly valuable because that's probably one of the things getting in the ways of them introducing this payments thing more broadly. But, you know, there's that story. I don't know if you've used it, but the Facebook portal, it's a really nice product. It's cheap. It's effective. We bought it during the beginning of COVID. The kids could see their grandparents and my parents can read them a book through it, a bedtime story. It's a pretty cool but I think the number, if you ask people, and I think even they publicly talked about this on Twitter, I think Boz has talked about it. Trust is the biggest issue. People don't want that thing in their living room from Facebook specifically. And so to sum it all up, today, Facebook is a business with over three and a half billion monthly actives, doing a $100 billion run rate, 20 to 30% top line Kager. Opportunities seem endless. What is it that at the end of the day is the most important thing to Facebook. And as someone who's both an operator and an investor, what can we learn from the evolution of Facebook over the course of the last decade? I think the most important thing for them is to create value for their user base. And that value can come in the form of showing you pictures of your 
family's kids, their social validation, there's things that they provide value. And I'm obviously a Kool-Aid drinker, but like connecting people, making that a very valuable experience while addressing the concerns of trust, election fraud. I mean, all these huge, huge issues that people give them a lot of crap about, but gosh, they are big, hairy, bald issues that no one, frankly, has dealt with all that well. So I think getting it right, I think getting that product experience right and making it work for people. And I think if they can continue to do that, people keep showing up. And then that's sort of the core, that is the engine of the business. And then obviously wrapped around that, the drivetrain, if you will, right? If that's the engine, the drivetrain and for now is a massive, largest advertising business on the planet, I think, outside of Google and the ability to continue to find ways to match the right person to the right message at the right time, which by the way, incidentally, is also a service. It's uh, helping people discover things they like and want and continuing to evolve that algorithm and see that it performs and performs means there's Facebook, there's the advertiser, there's the user. It has to work for all three of those and continuing to make that work is super, super important. So I think those are sort of the big things they have to get right and continue to get right. The third one would be expansionary efforts. We talked about an auto marketplace or we talked about some of these spinoffs of products like Portal or VR. They're obviously making some bigger, longer term bets. That's not a world I know all that much about, but those things are important. Lessons for entrepreneurs and kind of executives. I actually think having been so close to that organization for as long as I have, a lot of the lessons in their business come to culture. I think Zuckerberg is a tremendous leader, very decisive, very capable. And, and I think he cares a lot genuinely about the vision and where this thing goes. And I think their ability to communicate, align people quickly and meaningfully. I've seen multiple times where I think they reorg like a lot of these companies every nine months or something. But every time they do something different, we want to shift to newsfeed. Okay, everybody talks about newsfeed all the time. We think this is important. We're going to move the mobile first. I've seen them oh, like a military in a sense, even though it's a pretty casual cultural place. When they decide they're going to go do something, I have yet to see an organization that moves so fluidly and so fast and so aligned towards their next objective. So I think a lot of the learnings I take away from them is my dream would be to build a culture as aligned and inspired as their culture, because it really is very much that. I think that's at the heart of, and I think there's some interaction with what they built and how they played with it. But there were lots of companies at one point that had large growing user bases, and they were one of the few who have ended up where they've ended up. For investors, it is a classic one. I bought a lot of Facebook at a really low price because I could see it working before most people. Then I sold it probably like sometimes the biggest things and their best bets are still the best bets. This thing is still essentially in the second or third inning. People just underestimate upside in some of these situations, especially someone who really has the sports analogy would be like, you know, would you just stop betting on Jordan after his fifth season because he's won a lot? Like, no, <laughs> he's going to go play a bunch of more games and go win a lot more games. Why would you just start betting against him or pick someone else to bet on? Like, I think that in lesson for investors for this one, and almost every investor has a story of, man, I, I at some point I sold too early in the Facebook situation, myself included. And I bought back and still done well with it. I think that's the big lesson is like, man, we are in the second inning still a dominant player with all the kinds of unique unfair advantages. There's still a lot of upside here. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for joining us and helping the audience to better understand Facebook's advertising business. I think given where you sit and your experience in the ecosystem, you have a really great way of simplifying something that's a highly complex and dynamic environment. We thank you for taking the time. My pleasure. I hope you enjoyed the breakdown of Facebook. It's one of the cleanest example of network effects that exists, and I'm excited to see how the company evolves into the future. To find more episodes of breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S.com. 